please subscribe to my channel. Share different movies and videos every day. Since Harold had been captured by the Pechenegg, the group came to the leader's camp to prepare a rescue plan. You must promise me something. The Khan will return with many men, and they will catch you if you try to take me with you. I didn't come all this way to leave you behind. But I did. Do you know what this is? Mariam gave it to me. By bringing me this far, you have given me the chance to redeem myself to again, the old father of my faith. Now when I die, he will turn my spirit into a bird and I will fly to Uchmak, where my wife has been waiting for me for a long time. Leif took Kuria hostage and walked into the tent. When the leader saw Kuria, he sent someone to inform the king. However, this did not lead to their rescue, instead, they found themselves in even more danger, seeing the three captured and controlled by the enemy in the distance, Elena and her companions advanced cautiously. And this is where you thank me for coming. This is where I ask if you have another plan. They first freed the Pechenegs' horses and then set their tents on fire. The enemy's camp immediately descended into chaos. As Elena shot arrows at the enemies, she also cut the ropes binding Harold. At the same time, Leaf was also freed. The camp leader charged at Leaf in an attempt to stop his escape, but the leader was no match for Leaf, and he was quickly dealt with. Despite Kuria constantly urging them not to rescue him, Leaf refused to abandon him. He couldn't watch his friend die there. The six of them quickly mounted their horses and fled the burning camp. At the same time, Kuria's brother also brought people to the vicinity of the camp. From a distance, he saw his brother leaving and was filled with rage. He immediately ordered a pursuit, intent on capturing Kuria and killing him. At this time, the ship had been righted, and everyone was pushing it into deeper water. However, when no one was looking, Kuria turned and headed into the woods. He could hear his companions calling out, but he didn't respond. Kuria had more important matters at hand, he sought revenge. The two brothers finally met, and he kept taunting Kuria. I have heard a thousand tales of you, shivering in a prison in the north. And I thought of you often while I was there. He even drew a knife and sliced Kuria's ear. Are you so scared of me, that you must use your sword instead of your knife to kill me? I am not scared. I don't believe you. I think it is you who is the coward. It is you who is frightened of the blind Pechenegg, who is here to kill you. <laughs> After hearing Kuria's words, the king said that he did not need to use a knife to kill a blind man, as it was a cowardly act. As soon as he got close to Kuria, Kuria blew the powder on his face. As a result, the brutal king was poisoned. First he couldn't see, then he couldn't breathe. Kuria finally fulfilled his desire for revenge. He had lived in torment just for this day. Although death awaited him next, he smiled. Successful in his revenge. Kuria was pulled by two horses, and the Pechenegg had left countless wounds on him. They tormented him relentlessly, and the companions on the ship watched Kuria suffer with immense pain. Leif picked up a bow and arrow and then shot Kuria, ending his suffering. The ship soon reached the Dnieper River, where the route to Constantinople was clear. However, they were not happy. At that moment, Leif saw a bird fly by and smiled. He knew it was Kuria. He was flying to heaven to reunite with his wife. 
far away in Novgorod, Olaf had been searching for the location of Jomsborg. Just as he was about to give up and head back, the local bishop came to support him and encouraged Olaf in his noble cause of eradicating pagans. Inspired, Olaf vowed to find Jomsborg and erase it from the map. As the fleet sailed on the sea, they found the exiled Jorinder. At that point, Jorinder was barely clinging to life. The smile on Olaf's face after seeing the weakened Jorinder. It was the first time Jorinder encountered Olaf, and he was unaware of the man's silver tongue. Though he was initially skeptical, when Olaf mentioned knowing Herrick, Jorinder's expression changed. Olaf presented himself as a protector of trade routes. Speaking of Herrick's raids against the Vikings, he told Jorinder that he harbored no hatred for Jomsborg. He only despised Herrick. Hearing Olaf's words, the people next to him gave a puzzled expression, because this is not what Olaf meant before. Olaf soon convinced Jorinder that they had a common enemy. He even promised Jorinder that after overthrowing Herrick, he would make Jorinder the leader of Jomsborg. For ships anchored outside Jomsborg, and the people inside were already preparing for battle. The catapults launched fireball projectiles, but they missed Olaf's ship due to insufficient range. This made Olaf smirk dismissively, learning that Jorinder is with Olaf. Freitas doesn't believe that Jorinder would betray him. She even understood Jorinder's actions, as he didn't know that Herrick was dead. The most important thing is that he doesn't understand Olaf's insidiousness. Regarding how to fend off Olaf's attack, some suggested taking the offensive, while others argued for holding their ground to make him retreat. However, Freitas rejected both proposals. Now that the location of Jomsborg had been exposed, Neither striking first nor making a stand made any sense. Because Olaf will return to Kattegat and bring more enemies, and Jomsborg will definitely not be able to resist. Freitas knew Olaf too well, if given the chance, he would eradicate all the Vikings who worshipped the old gods. Meanwhile, aboard Olaf's ship, Jorinder was outlining Jomsborg's topography to the others. He held a deep hatred for Herrick. Their battle plan was to use a vanguard to entangle the sentries on the cliffs and then quickly take the main outpost at the front gate. Once the main outpost was secured, Jomsborg would be defenseless. Olaf suggested that Jorinder personally go to Jomsborg for negotiations. The two sides organized a pre-battle meeting, and Jorinder stated he was there to negotiate with Herrick. It was only at that moment that he realized Herrick was dead. Upon seeing Jomsborg's new leader, Jorinder was taken aback. He began to regret his actions. Olaf's reason for the negotiation was to obtain Harold's son. Harold was a Christian, and his son could not grow up in a world of pagans. Freitas, knowing Olaf's true nature, bluntly stated that Olaf feared Harold's child would compete with his own son for the throne. Clearly, the negotiation was completely meaningless. Olaf only had one intention, to destroy Jomsborg. The purpose of Olaf's trip was mainly to personally survey the terrain. As he turned to leave, Gudrid shouted traitor from the crowd. Mother, don't call me that name. You have brought shame and disgrace. No! Mother, mother. Jorinder rushes to his mother and says he didn't know Herrick was dead. Immediately, Gudrid discreetly handed a holy relic to her son and told him that Freitas wanted him to keep an eye on the port before pushing him away. Freitas instructed her men to bring all the firebombs to Jomsborg, leaving none at the sentry posts. Jorinder looked at the holy bones in his hand thoughtfully. Olaf asked for his opinion, but this time Jorin urged Olaf to abandon the idea of an immediate attack. He sent Olaf back to Kattegat to gather more ships and soldiers to attack Jomsborg again. Upon hearing his suggestion, the others disagreed with him. They all saw that Jomsborg's ship was being repaired, so they couldn't lose the opportunity to attack at all costs. Jorin wanted to prove that this was a trap set by the enemy, but Olaf sensed something was off. He didn't trust Jorin at all, especially after Jorin learned that Herrick was dead. This was the best psychological tactic against someone inherently suspicious. Jorinder's actions only strengthened Olaf's resolve to attack Jomsborg immediately. Jorinder led a portion of the group to the location of the sentry on the cliff. As they burst out of the underbrush, the archers hidden in the woods began shooting at them. Jorinder attacked from the back of the group. Even though Jorinder had only one hand, he showed no fear when facing the strong man. <laughs> Jorinder plunged his dagger into the man's stomach, but it didn't seem to have any effect. In the instant the man raised his battle axe, Jorinder summoned his last bit of strength to stab the dagger into the enemy's neck. Jorinder told his companions to signal to Olaf quickly. Although he wasn't sure why Jorinder acted this way, he knew it was part of the plan. He stood on the cliff, waving the flag. On the ship, Olaf sailed into Jomsborg. Jorinder wears Skuld's sacred bone around his neck, and before he dies, he asks his companion to tell Gudrid that he is not a traitor.
Olaf's ship entered Jomsborg, and the path was clear, only Freitas waited for them at the dock. Olaf looked around the port, puzzled, observing that there were indeed no signs of an ambush. As soon as the ship docked, Freitas turned to head back. She grabbed the rope hanging from the wooden post, pulling it as she walked. With the battle imminent, no one noticed the bubbles on the water's surface. Olaf had stepped onto the dock, ready to duel Freitas. For the sake of fairness in their duel, Freitas requested that Olaf move the ships away from the dock to prevent anyone from intervening, as it would greatly disadvantage her. As the ships began to leave, Freitas instructed Sven to step aside and watch. Why don't you come here where you can see better? What does it say on your sword? It says the Keeper of the Fate. It is my destiny to protect those who worship the old gods. Before the duel commenced, Olaf urged Freitas to accept baptism, claiming it would grant her eternal life. When Freitas heard Olaf mention eternal life, she asked if everyone on the ship had been baptized. They are. Each and every one. Good. After receiving Olaf's response, Freitas suddenly threw the torch she held into the water. <laughs> The surface ignited in flames, and the people on the ship jumped into the water, but it was oil, and the fire couldn't be extinguished. Seeing his men engulfed in flames, Olaf hurriedly took Sven away from the dock, chasing after Freitas. This was a one-on-one -on -one confrontation. Olaf, being a strong man, swung his axe with tremendous force, making it difficult for Freitas to defend against him. Olaf knocked the weapon out of Freitas' hand, but she was not willing to back down. Thus, they engaged in the most primal forms of combat, their stamina rapidly depleting. Both struggled to their feet in search of weapons, and Olaf managed to secure the axe first. Freitas ran further away to grab a spear. In the end, Freitas thrust her spear into Olaf's body. In his dying moments, Olaf expressed gratitude to Freitas, saying that she had made him a martyr, and that his name would be remembered by all. But who is left to tell your story? Seeing this scene, Sven was filled with fear. Get up, King of Norway. However, Freitas did not kill him but extended her hand instead. On the other side, at the Dnieper River, Miriam died of illness in a dilapidated temple. She never made it to Constantinople. Before she died, she entrusted Leif with a key, passing on the small house in Constantinople to him. Miriam told him that it contained much knowledge. Just as the people found the mast and prepared to set sail again, the Emperor of Constantinople arrived. In their astonishment, Elena elegantly stepped out of the tent. At that moment, everyone realized that Elena was the most precious cargo, she would become the new Queen of Constantinople. Along the way, Elena and Harold developed feelings for each other, yet now she had become someone unattainable for Harold. The Emperor of Constantinople gifted Harold a ring and promised to grant him one wish. Harold needed time to think. While he had the Emperor's promise, he had lost Elena. You could have told me. And I do know, what would you have counseled me to do? Not identify yourself. And we would have both arrived in Constantinople empty-handed. Now you have the favor of the Emperor himself. And you are his empress. Out of my reach. Nothing is out of your reach. At this time in Kattegat, the young king of Norway returned to his mother. <laughs> How did you get here? It must be Freitas. And with him came Freitas holding the child. She didn't have to send Sven back in person, but she did it anyway. Elfjifu expressed her deep gratitude to Freitas and inquired what Freitas desired in return. Peace. Thus, the two mothers reached an agreement, Kattegat and Jomsborg would not infringe upon each other. As she departed, Freitas looked around the familiar hall, memories of past conversations echoing in her ears. I am within my right to take revenge. I believe her! 
I am proud of you. Thank you. You will not fail them if you do not fail yourselves. We will not. If we die, so do our gods. Leif and Harold also arrived in Constantinople, a bustling city unlike any they had ever seen. What awaited them next?